The title of my lecture today is to take Valentine's Day to heart um, and women's health uh, 2021. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, we want to know whether there are any differences. These are the objectives of today's talk. Any differences between men and women um, and cardiovascular disease. We want to understand how death from heart disease compares um, with other common diseases that women have. Um, and we also want to understand um, why there may be some differences. We also want to know whether the symptoms between men and women are the same. Um, are women who have heart attacks treated the same as men? Uh, and another objective of today's talk is what other syn syndromes might be involved um, and is there a difference in prevalence between men and women and what are those differences? What women can do also to help themselves and further promote their health. Uh, so that's our objectives for today. And the main question is, are there differences between men and women? So as you know, there's a lot of differences in many respects between men and women. When a guy says hi, kind of just means hi. Uh, when a woman says hi, it can mean a lot of different things as depicted in this cartoon. George Carlin kind of said it best. He says, all you have to know about men and women is that women are crazy and men are stupid. And one of the reasons why women are crazy is because men are stupid. So George Collin realized this, and he was a pretty perceptive guy in his time. But on a serious note, um, we want to kind of understand cardiovascular mortality um, and what the trends are um, and gender differences between men and women in the United States. And you can see from this slide um, that in the 1980s, um, there was pretty high mortality from, in both men and women for cardiovascular disease. And, that's the time when we started to put together our treatments, effective treatments for heart disease. Before this, we didn't have statins. We didn't know about uh, stenting and balloon angioplasty and heart, open heart surgeries that were just coming around as help for uh, people with heart disease. And you can see when that got introduced, that mortality for men did pretty good. It started dropping um, as depicted in the blue line on this slide. Um, but you see the red line kind of didn't move, kind of stayed the same. And um, in the late uh, 1990s, early 2000s, there was a pivotal study for women. Before that, the Women's Health Initiative, there was really not any um, studies that really kind of used women as the subjects primarily. And that was an interesting study because it was a study about hormone therapy. Back in, and, and those of us who are old enough to remember back in the 18, you know, 1985, 1990s, in that area, women's hormone therapy was a big thing. There were books, there were New York Times front page articles, many, many uh, periodicals that um, had uh, women taking hormones, replacement therapy after menopause. It was the so-called fountain of youth. And until the Women's Health Initiative study was published, which actually studied the role of hormones and their effect on postmenopausal women, it was thought that it was very beneficial. And lo and behold, you know, when you do studies, you find out things sometimes that you don't want to find out. And one of the things they did find out is that hormone therapy was not great for women's cardiovascular health. There was increased clotting, hypertension, pulmonary embolism. These were all serious health problems that were um, worse in the hormone-treated group. So then it started to dawn on people that, well, if what we think is right is not really right, that's where science comes in. And that's when we started to promote thinking about women and we started looking at these data points. And this is public data, but it really wasn't looked at. It was there, but nobody really looked at it. So you could see that black line on the slide when, when this revelation happened, that maybe we should look at women as women, not as men. And you could see the mortality had dropped dramatically to where in 2010 and 2011, the lines actually crossed, where women actually did better than men. 
Now, the disturbing thing is that's to 2014, but if you pull these curves out further, you start to see that both men and women are increasing uh, mortality in cardiovascular disease, which is a disturbing trend. And that is maybe because of the obesity epidemic. So this is being looked at and studies are being done right now to try and dissect out what's happening because this may be the first generation after hours that will actually experience a life expectancy decline. That hasn't happened for years in the United States. And last year, the year before COVID, and I'm not including COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, last the year before that, we actually did see a decline in average life expectancy in the United States. So an important thing to keep in mind of. Now, this is a slide of women's uh, heart disease death rates, um, age 35 plus by county. And you can see in the United States, now some of this is population-based, so there's less people, there may not be as much heart disease, maybe they eat more uh, more healthier foods because they're not saturated with restaurants and, and stuff like that. But you could see that the fry belt, which is that midsection of the country, where there's a lot of fried food going on um, and a lot of saturated fat in the food, you can see the prevalence of heart disease off the chart. Um, but if you zoom down on Long Island, I know it's a little bit hard to see in the slide and I can't really zoom up for you. But if you look at Long Island, it's got, it's got a deep red color to it. Um, so um, that's, that's a warning sign that here on Long Island, it's, we're not living the healthiest lifestyles we can be living. Um, and an important, important fact for women, because this is, this is not men and women, this is a slide of only women. So let's uh, talk about cardiovascular disease and mortality in the United States. Total deaths in the United States in women in 2014 amounted to about 1.2 million uh, women died. And out of the 1.2 million women, cardiovascular disease was about 400,000 deaths, accounted in that 1.2 million. Chronic lung disease, COPD, um, probably as a result of smoking, 77,000, okay? And lung disease uh, after that, um, which is more like lung cancer, um, what lung cancer and malignancy accounted for 70,000 70, deaths. And breast cancer, as you can see, is 40,000. No, number four on that list. Now, one death due to heart disease occurs about every 79 seconds in the U.S., okay? And cardiovascular death rate is one in three. Breast cancer death rates are one in 38. Now, this is not to beat up on breast cancer. Uh, this is to let you know that we're doing a good job on breast cancer because we're aware of it. And women get mammograms, they get early intervention, and it's really made a big difference. But it does show you also that you're far more likely to die of a cardiovascular event than breast cancer in the U.S. right now, which is something that patients really have to be aware of, and I don't think most women are. This is the, uh, an interesting slide, and it's the remaining lifetime risk for CVD versus breast cancer in women at age 40. So when you hit 40, we measured how many people are gonna die of these different diseases. And if you took any cardiovascular disease, which includes coronary heart disease, which is heart attack, you take congestive heart failure, and you take stroke, which is brain injury, and you put them all together, it's a one in three chance of dying from any cardiovascular disease for a woman at age 40 whereas breast cancer is one in 38. So just another way of looking at that data, but again, very interesting. Now, we're gonna talk about this because up until recently, we've had this bikini approach to women's health. The medical community has viewed women's health in a reproductive manner. We look at breasts and ovaries and pap smears um, as the whole total focus of women's health, and that was, really put to the forefront by one of uh, 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 physicians, a female physician, Dr. Weniger at Emory University. And she proposed that we need to move beyond the bikini and protect women in all aspects, including heart disease. She happened to be a cardiologist, of course. So um, what does, you know, heart disease, does sex really matter? Women and heart disease, 
Does it really matter? Well, women live longer than men. We know that. And we all have to die of something. But a heart attack, you know, young women are more likely to die of. And there's also loss of, you know, family structure, loss of uh, income as women have, you know, gone, uh, become a bigger percentage of the workforce. Um, women, of course, are not traditionally included in most of the heart trials until the last 10 years. I believe there's still a basic science gap in women's health. Um, the perception uh, until just recently is that women's hearts function in much the same way as a smaller man's heart. Is that tr really true? So the question remains, if a woman's heart functions the same way a smaller man's heart does, why do women do worse than men? It is a perplexing question. So what do we really know? <clears throat> well, what does the research show? Because in the end, you have to drill down to the granularity of what science is going to show us. We've learned that in a very difficult way with the COVID epidemic. So let's use the science to get to this killer. This is a cartoon, but is very apropos to today's talk. <clears throat> we have studies of fruit flies, comma, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkeys, and men with this condition. But the research using women's subjects just never occurred to anybody. And this is a doctor explaining a condition to a woman who's not really sure what to do because there's no data. Well, you know, that changed a little bit. And, you know, we now can see what's going on. And this is a study which basically looked at women um, and cardiovascular clinical, clinical trials, okay? And these are the various disease states on the bottom line, coronary artery disease, heart failure, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, and hypertension. And you can see the red arrows above those um, grayish blue um, uh, uh, bars that show that that's the percentage of women that were enrolled in these trials. And the white bar shows the prevalence or the percentage of women in the population that have that disease. And you can see that, you know, there are huge differences between prevalence and who's actually being studied. And the black bars are looking at the death rate attributed to that disease. And you can see, so there, there's a tremendous gap there. And this, you know, death rate, you know, and knowledge gaps uh, per pervade uh, the medical literature, um, especially uh, before 10 years ago. <clears throat> so as you can see from this trial, um, this is a major health issue for women. Only rarely women had even broken 40% enrollment um, in these trials. So let's talk about the guidelines because, you know, the guidelines are, are expert panel as well as data driven. National guidelines are produced to have standards across the country. Do the guidelines result in care that's equal to men and women? Hospital data on compliance with guidelines and outcomes is all there. Um, this is called, this database is called Get With the Guidelines Database. So let's look at the Get With the Guidelines Database. And just to give you a format on, you know, I know most of you are not scientists or doctors out there, but you can read this uh, if I give you just a simple explanation. Uh, the treatment, okay, on the left-hand side of the slide shows the kinds of treatments that are available for heart disease. The middle, where it says adjusted women versus men, is basically telling us whether... <clears throat> A person has the same treatment, which that number that's uh, sitting there would be a one if they had equal treatment. Um, if it's below one, they did not get equal treatment. And if it was above one, they got better treatment. So you could see um, um, in the box here, er er for early medical therapy, for people having a heart attack, and this is women, that 
the number was 0.86 and 0.90 for aspirin and beta blocker, which women then received less early life-saving treatment than their cohort age match men, okay? <clears throat> Secondly, patients or women patients received less cardiac catheterization, less angioplasty or stent placement, less open heart surgery, and less revascularization by any form. And you can see the numbers there, all less than one, which means they received less. Now, in the U.S., in 2006 or so, there was a goal to open arteries quicker because when someone has a heart attack, a heart attack is closed by a loss of blood flow in an artery feeding the muscle of the heart. And this door to balloon time, which is what happened, uh, what we used as a metric to kind of understand how to save heart tissue and heart muscle. Because when heart muscle dies, people either die from congestive heart failure from it or ventricular arrhythmias, or they end up being uh, having significant disability, shortness of breath, unable to function, not able to work. It's a significant impact if patients even survive. And there's a tremendous death rate from it, as we all know. So we looked at this, and we, we knew that if we get the arteries open quicker, we could go ahead and save muscle, which translates into saved lives and less disability. So in 2006, the cardiology community up until that time was pretty resistant to trying to move in a direction to, to get these patients' blood flow restored. I mean, people had to... You know, people had to be on call. People had to come in in the middle of the night. They had to have processes to get these patients moved from the emergency room to a different area so that we could get to them quicker. And it took a total restructuring of, of, of medicine. And the, the so-called door to balloon time became the standard. And you can see from this slide that in 2005, the median time to uh, door to balloon time, which means opening and restoration of blood flow, was 96 minutes. That's um, on the right-hand slide uh, there. And that it did drop down in 2010 to 64 minutes, okay? And that's because the New York Times kind of published an article and embarrassed the cardiology community uh, into moving faster in this, uh, in this uh, area. So... Um, that is what we were focusing on. And we want to know whether women were experiencing this decline in balloon to door time, which saves lives, saves muscle, and decreases risk going forward for these patients. And you can see in the Get With the Guidelines, which all hospitals are very proud on these, on these times. And the time starts when you hit the emergency room door to the time that the artery actually has blood flow restored in the cardiac catheterization lab, because most of uh, reperfusion is done this way, although people have drug reperfusion in rural areas too. We can do this with uh, thrombolytic therapy or certain types of drugs. And you can see here that these numbers are all below one, two. Door to balloon time less than 90 minutes, women did not do well um, as well as men. Reperfusion therapy, that's the drug therapy, also did not do well. So um, fibrolytic therapy, which is the drug therapy, and reperfusion is overall drugs and, and uh, um, catheter-based strategies, also did not do well. And the only place that women actually excelled uh, from men was in death. Women did better. They actually died faster. So these are like kind of like you would think in 2021, kind of startling things. But again, was never really looked at. And this stu these are study, you know, data from 2008. So a lot of work has gone in to try and improve on these metrics. And we are, we're getting there. And that's why you see those mortality curves coming down. Now, when you go to the hospital, there's, there's pre-printed orders so that aspirin goes in, beta blockers are used, anticoagulants are used when appropriate, balloon door to balloon time is tracked on both, both men and women. So that kind of discrimination and bias is not there. So 
age difference in, in what we call ST segment elevation myocardial infarctions. So do younger patients have better outlook than older patients? So um, what, is the, what is the differences there? Well, we found in many studies that um, women of younger age um, were still having uh, problems uh, with uh, quality of care, and that there were substantial differences um, in evidence-based medicine um, in younger women uh, when compared to men um, in any corresponding age category, and that um, there was higher in-hospital mortality. And this is a published uh, article from 2012. It was not that long ago. Both door to thrombolytic time and door to balloon time was longer f for both younger and older women when compared with younger and older men. So um, younger women have a higher risk uh, because they have a longer lifespan and they have to deal with the consequences of a heart attack for a longer period of time and there's less chance of dying from other diseases when you're younger. And we see that there's, there's a gap there. And this is um, another study that kind of looked at this uh, in an age-related fashion, they defined women less than 45 years old as younger and women over 45 years old as um, uh, older. And I would have agreed with that uh, mostly when I was a young resident, but now I take a little bit of offense to that uh, age break. But nonetheless, um, that's what they used in this study. And they, you could see that any bar on the right-hand side of that straight line that says in hospital death is any, the further to the right, the worse you did. So you could see that the younger women really had a significant impact um, on in hospital death from cardiovascular diseases, and again, published in 2012, which is not that long ago. Um, so women in, in this trial were less likely to receive uh, ACE, ARBs, which are blood pressure medicines, um, and also help with congestive heart failure. They were less likely to receive statins, the lipid-lowering medication. They were less likely at discharge to have controlled blood pressure. Few achieved goal to door balloon time less than 90 minutes, and the, when we looked at race, and we just re-looked at this data, this is something that's, that's really fresh data, it's within the last several years, black women and Latina women fared even worse. So if you're a woman of color, you did not do as well as, as Caucasian women. So there's a lot of bias out there, and we need to work on this. It is a big problem. This is also another study. It was uh, published in 2015, again, not that long ago. Temporal trends in sex differences in revascularization and outcomes in myocardial infarction, ST segment myocardial infarction in, in the United States. That's a certain type of heart attack and usually a pretty aggressive one. The ST segment uh, elevation MI is considered a very serious and medical emergency uh, for us. And you could see that women received less reperfusion they had higher in-hospital mortality, and their length of stay um, was more than men, which means that they were more complicated because they had to stay in the hospital. The hospitals, as you know, are trying to get you out the door as fast as possible. So the, the length of stay is up. That's telling you something, and it's telling you that there's a significant impact, both economically and on women's overall health. Now, there was a trial um, done called the Virgo trial. This is in 2015. And they looked at door to balloon time in young women because they were trying to find out what was going on. And you can see that uh, women, on average, compared to men, the men in the blue bars and women in the red bars, took an average of eight minutes longer. Okay? Um, door to balloon time and transfer to another hospital took an average of uh, 30 minutes longer. In fact, in the women, they didn't even meet the metric, the pre-specified metric or goals uh, for the American uh, Heart Association, ACC. And time is muscle, and it relates to outcomes with these life-saving procedures. So serious, very serious uh, uh, problem that has to be conquered. This is a, a trial called the Triumphs trial and sex differences in rehospitalization. So. Obviously, these patients get discharged. They maybe didn't do as well as men, but how does it translate after they get out of the hospital? And you can see from this slide that um, 
in the solid bars, those light solid bars, that's females, the 31% rehospitalization rate versus um, the dash bar, which is males, um, in the group that was the younger group. And um, even in the older group, um, women, women fared a little bit better or were a little bit closer to men. But in the young group, there was a significant, this has a significant impact because these people are working age uh, people and they're running, and they're also, uh, you know, at a time where they're bringing up their children. So it's having a significant impact on families as well as the workforce. So, um, and, and because of that rehospitalization rate, there's a significant impact to all of us because we all pay for the, for the hospitalizations. It's very costly. So this is termed in the cardiology uh, world as the Yentl syndrome. And if any of you are Barbara Streisand fan, you'll recognize that she was in this movie called Yentl. It was quite a, quite a few years ago. But basically, it was about a, a, a religious woman who wanted to have, uh, to be able to study the Bible, Talmud, um, uh, like a man, because in Orthodox Judaism, women and men are kind of so, somewhat separated. So because she had such passion for her religion, she dressed up as a man and basically was looking to have the same rights and privileges as a man. And we call this the Yentl syndrome in cardiology because women are not being treated the same as men. And of course, many women have been misdiagnosed and have paid the price for this because they, they aren't getting the same exact treatment. And the question is, you know, why? Well, this is a slide. This is a picture, a well-known picture. I think we've all seen the all doctors who might be watching this or medical professionals watching this program will know this slide. This is a famous slide from a gentleman named Frank Netter. He was a medical illustrator um, who, uh, before we had fancy computer uh, um, graphics, um, he did all these uh, pictures by hand to explain medical syndromes. So the most common symptom for men and women is chest pain, discomfort, and squeezing in the chest. But women are also more likely to have atypical symptoms. So here we're teaching our young medical students, women doctors, men doctors, that it's going to be a man. It's going to be in the cold weather. That's what this this picture is showing, there's a stiff wind blowing, he's grabbing his chest, and what we call a Levine sign, which we're all taught in medical school. And if you look carefully, you can even see a cigarette in the snow because he dropped his cigarette from that chest pain. He just had a heavy meal in a restaurant. So it kind of tells you the clinical situation. And this was all, this is what's gonna happen, and it's always a man in the picture, not a woman. And it doesn't talk about women and the atypical symptoms. One third of women have upper body pain. They have shoulder and neck and jaw pain. They have abdominal or epigastric burning. Sometimes they have nausea. Sometimes it's just short of breath. We know that extreme fatigue can be a cardiac symptom, lightheadedness and dizziness and palpitations. So it's not always what's depicted in this picture. Um, there's more to it. And we're trying to train our young women and men physicians to be aware of this, to be more sensitive to it. Because if you don't, if you're not sensitive to it, you'll never find it. If you don't take a temperature, you'll never find a fever. So you need to do this as a, as a training uh, physician. And we try to get that done. So there are sex differences. Um, there's a lot less known about this. It seems that, you know, younger patients suffer more um, than uh, older patients. 90% of young women and men presented with chest pressure tightness, so that is still the classic symptom. But women are more likely to present with three additional non-chest pain symptoms versus men. Among patients who sought care for symptoms before the hospitalization, women are less likely to be told that their symptoms were heart-related. Okay, and that was just published in 2018. Um, the Virgo response to symptoms is very interesting, too. Um, this is basically, you know, how people respond to their symptoms. They did a questionnaire. So you can see that in men, uh, you know, they mostly thought that, um, you could see 21% thought it was muscle pain. In women, they thought their symptoms were more likely from stress and anxiety. Women also 
um, when they were thinking about what this could be, very often they didn't think it was a heart problem. They thought it was due to something else. Whereas men, on the other hand, thought that, yeah, well, this in my chest might be something muscular, but it might also be something else. Maybe it's a heart problem. It came to their consciousness. The epiphany happened. The light bulb went off a little bit quicker in the men. Um, women attributed their disease, their, their heart disease, to something else. These are women who came in and ultimately went on to have a heart attack. The physician response was also quite interesting in this study. Here you can see um, the percentage of uh, women and men who sought medical attention. And you can see women actually sought medical attention to their, for their symptoms way, equal to or better than men. Okay, But... If you look here where I circled these, you could see the provider's response to the patient was quite different. And this is the provider did not think the symptoms were heart related. 53% in women, only 36% in men. So those biases and the training that we give our young medical students, PAs, nurse practitioners, and other medical professionals and nurses um, is biased. And we need to create a even playing field so that this is thought of early in the game. It's life-saving. Under diagnosis of women with heart attack, we diagnose heart attacks by symptoms, EKGs, changes, measurement of cardiac enzymes called troponin. We use the same threshold of troponin in women and men, um, even though women have much smaller hearts than men. Some hospitals are moving to gender cutoffs for troponin levels. These are the blood tests that we use in the emergency room to diagnose MI. Gender-specific troponin levels can improve sensitivity uh, for uh, women's heart attacks. And women are more likely to be misdiagnosed and undertreated than men for a heart attack. So this is just a quick study, and it's kind of busy, so I'm not going to belabor this slide. But this slide kind of looked at um, high-sensitivity, gender-specific troponin levels, and it found that you can reclassify women to high risk um, using a more specific uh, type of troponin level. And uh, you can see in the bottom right that patients got reclassified um, women got reclassified with a high sensitivity assay than with a regular test. And a lot of hospitals are now going to be moving towards developing different ra reference ranges for both men and women, which will help pick up more uh, women with heart attacks. So I think we're moving in the right direction there. Women in cardiac arrest, let's talk about that. When a woman has a cardiac arrest in a public area, she's less likely to receive life-saving CPR from bystanders than men. CPR can more than double the chance to survive uh, a myocardial infarction or cardiac arrest in the field. 90% of patients who have a cardiac arrest in the field do pass away. So this is a big deal. Potential causes for this is that bystanders are afraid to touch a woman's chest area and are reluctant to remove her clothes or potentially expose or touch breasts, even if they're trying to save her life. Many people are train not trained in CPR or do not recertify, and that's a big problem in this country because everybody should have to do this. It should be probably part of renewing your license, okay? Um, training mannequins. Now, here's a mannequin. You see there, uh, someone's training on a mannequin called Annie. Well, Annie doesn't look like a woman. Okay, they're not gender specific. So I kind of did a little, um, we did a little bit of a, uh, I guess, uh, um, modification to Annie. And I think this is a more appropriate CPR dummy. Um, someone to practice on that is not, so that when people see a woman collapse in the field, that they're not gonna be afraid to go up and approach that woman, see if she has a pulse, and if not, to start CPR. And I think this is, would be a big help if our training mannequins started to look a little bit more lifelike. So is there a, is a disease the same in men and women? A big question. 
So women have more of a female pattern to their disease. They have coronary disease like men, but they also have microvascular angina, coronary dissection and plaque erosion. And they also have something called Takasubo syndrome or stress cardiomyopathy, otherwise known as broken heart syndrome. The male pattern, although we have seen Takasubos in male, male too, and some of these other things in men also, but it's much, much, much less common. The male pattern is mostly obstructive coronary artery disease where the artery, the big artery that you see on the slide here, gets blocked. The other small fine arteries can cause chest pain too, and we see that more often in women. So the model of progression is somewhat different in men and women. We're all born when we're a neonate with these beautiful clean arteries that you see on the left of the slide. Um, but as time progresses, the disease is a little different. So women may end up with plaque in the arteries, but they may end up with a different kind of layering of that plaque. And you can see all the way on the right-hand slide is the obstructive. That's when the, the lumen or the interior artery is so compromised, the yellow is cholesterol plaque, that blood flow is now really inhibited. In women, sometimes the artery is more of the crescent shape, which you see next to it. And that causes a different kind of coronary artery disease. Microvascular dysfunction is what we call small vessel disease. And I have quite a few patients in my practice that have angina, and it seems just like a major blockage. And then when we do a catheterization, it's not there. We've eliminated every single other cause, and they have classic signs of heart disease, heart angina, or chest pain with exertion, yet they don't have any epicardial or large artery blockage. And this is from vascular dysfunction. Okay, and this may also have something to do with women who have hormonal problems like PCOS and uh, low estrogen levels. Uh, we see it a lot after menopause also. Well, um, these also go hand in hand with the pro atherosclerotic diseases such as hyperlipidemia, hypertension, smoking. So all that adds into it. But it causes vascular hyperreactivity. And you see the middle artery there where the arteries are contracting um, or getting the, the narrowing of the artery on top of some plaque. But it, it's causing the spasm is causing um, less blood flow. So that's vascular dysfunction. And there's an angiographic picture of what that looks like right below. So in women, we see a lot of plaque erosion. Um, and this can be seen on something called IVIS, or intravascular ultrasound. We can actually thread a ultrasound camera down the arteries and see what's going on, uh, on in the arteries. And it's done at Northwell uh, quite frequently to help us decide whether someone needs stenting or not. We just don't throw it in by eye many times. We actually look, um, look into the artery of intravascular ultrasound or perform something called FFR, which is a flow uh, measurement of how much blood flow is actually going down that artery. Um, but in women, you can see that the plaque sometimes erodes and slowly a thrombus forms on that plaque. That's that purplish thing that's called TH in the slide. And that is a thrombus forming on top of a cholesterol plaque um, and slowly um, occluding the artery. So this is just showing you the differences between plaque rupture, which is what happens frequently in men, where there's just a tear in the artery and a sudden clotting of that artery versus plaque erosion, which slowly occludes the artery to the point that it becomes a major emergency. So a somewhat different pathophysiology. Women also have dissections of the artery where the artery actually tears on the inside. And we see this commonly in pregnancies for some reason because there's elastase, um, uh, high elastase enzymes in women who are pregnant to help loosen up that pelvis, to help that pelvis flex to deliver that baby. There's also loosening of the joints and also the elastase uh, makes the blood vessels a little bit weaker. And we see dissections in uh, pregnant women. And it's one of the ways uh, pregnant women have heart attacks. Um, <clears throat> so this false lumen that you see where the arrow is, blood gets accumulates in there, and, and even though there's no cholesterol plaque, there's actually a blood clot in that artery, in that false lumen that's pinching off blood flow. You can see this in this angiographic picture 
Um, it's not the best picture in the world, but it is something that is reported um, in many, many women. It's associated with other diseases, such as fibromuscular dysplasia, lupus, the other connective tissue disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis, and is associated with pregnancy, as I stated earlier. So um, spontaneous coronary dissection accounts for 11% of all acute STEMI MIs, those, those bad MIs, the ST segment elevation MIs. It accounts for 9% of all females under the age of 50 with ACS. Um, the there are no randomized controlled trials for management, so we kind of, you know, the doctor has to use their, their wits to try and figure this out and diagnose it and treat it. Um, stenting is probably tried in these patients. Um, the mortality is 1% to 5%. And if it happens in the peripartum period after you deliver a baby, because this, um, we call this the fourth trimester, is the, 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 the time period after delivery, the first three months, is a vulnerable period for women. Um, so it can happen even postpartum. Um, let's talk about the other thing that I mentioned, Takasubo's cardiomyopathy. Um, or stress-related cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. Um, hopefully there's no broken hearts on Valentine's Day this year. But this is um, stress-related cardiomyopathy. It's a transient vascular dysfunction not caused by an acute, uh, acute clot. It's triggered by emotional stress many times with sudden reversible dysfunction of the pumping action of the heart. It accounts for 3% of all acute coronary syndromes that looks like an MI. I had women walk into my office with this and we call it, we see it's an acute MI. We're trying to get them to the hospital for that door to balloon time to make sure that we save muscle. And then we do the angiogram and we do not see a blockage, but yet they're having all the classic features of a, a, an acute coronary syndrome. It's 6% of all acute coronary syndromes or um, ST segment elevation um, in postmenopausal women. And the heart failure, luckily, it's reversible and resolves within weeks to months. This is what it looks like angiographically. The word takasubo means Japanese octopus pot. It was originally descri described in the Japanese medical literature. And it's a weakening of the heart muscle. And you can see the angiographic picture on the left looks very much like an octopus pot, which is on the right. This is a busy slide, but basically this shows the pathophysiology of what we think is going on. Um, it's still a matter of uh, some controversy, but that extra stress releases a lot of adrenaline, which has an effect on the microvascular structure of some vulnerable women's hearts. And um, that causes this acute syndrome. The newly described disease, it was described in Japan, of 1990 and now has been basically seen all over the world, recognized all over the world. Um, and it was formally classified as a primary acquired cardiomyopathy, which means an acquired weakness of the heart. Um, you can see the number of cases after it was formally described went way up. And again, it's termed broken heart syndrome or stress-induced um, cardiomyopathy. Um, it mimics an MI, it's triggered by emotional stress. Um, so if you have a huge blowout with someone um, or you got shocking news that someone passed away and you start having chest pain, pay attention to it because this could be the issue and you need to be hospitalized at least until you start to recover. Luckily enough, um, it's reversible um, and 90% occur in the peri or postmenopausal setting. Um, so the diverse triggers, uh, you know, we're not going to go through this, but grief, loss, desperation, bereavement, death of a spouse or a loved one um, can be triggers, but we've seen it for other reasons also. Um, so if you're having chest pain, you need to seek medical attention. Um, and again, 90% of women are over the age of 50. 50. I mean, you have to have a high level of suspicion. And a hallmark, luckily enough, is complete recovery with only about 10% of people recurring, having a recurrent attack at four years. So it can reoccur, but it's luckily enough not that common. <clears throat> so let's talk about research, because ultimately the research is where 
things change. Science moves a dial on these things. And you can see here the scales have to be tipped in favor of women. And that more than two decades ago, the National Health Institute instituted a women's health division. And the NIH scientists and leaders agreed that excluding women from clinical trials was bad for women and bad for science. In 1993, the NIH um, Revitalization Act required the inclusion of women in NIH-funded clinical trials. So finally, your tax dollars were working for you. Women are not just small men. So does cardiovascular risk factors affect women in the same way as men? So let's take a look at that. The prevalence of risk factors are different in men and women. Okay, and you can see here from the slide that um, smoking uh, actually less in men, more in women uh, these days. Diabetes and metabolic syndrome are also more in women. Um, so there are certain things, depression or more, believe it or not, is more in men. We're not really sure in women whether there's more or less. I guess COVID has kind of affected that a little bit. Um, but there's definitely more depression in women, more uh, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis in women. And men who used to smoke a lot are starting to not smoke as much, and women are catching up there a little bit. So it's something to be watched in the latest uh, literature. The American College of Cardiology created a risk calculator. This is something that you can use with your physician. It estimates the 10-year risk of heart disease between the ages of 40 and 79 and the lifetime risk between 20 and 59. Um, it has internal and external val validation, um, but is it really sex-specific? And this is just a picture of the risk calculator. Um, it asks questions about a combination of blood work, blood pressure, um, measurements to assess risk. And you can see in this particular patient, uh, as you plug in the numbers, the 10-year uh, risk can change and the lifetime risk can change. When we look at these risk calculators, we can um, get an estimate of all these different uh, things based on current lab exams, personal history, um, and what therapy would do to help reduce or uh, reduce this risk. And even in the guidelines most recently um, published for this risk calculator, and you can see it's a busy slide, but I want to draw your attention to the center there, that the risk um, should include a discussion of other enhancing risk factors. It's not just the classic ones that are on the left side here. It says the a ASCVD risk enhancers. Um, it's not just the classic risk factors, okay? Um, so there are other things that we can do to try and improve our uh, home in on one person's individual risk. So what is missing from these risk factors? Should we rely on the ASCVD risk calculator by itself? Well, one thing that, the, the, that has come up is that certain complications during pregnancy have implications for future heart. And this is not obviously captured in the ACVD uh, uh, um, risk calculator. Pregnancy can be nature's um, stress test, and the ACC has come up with this little poster to kind of summarize what those uh, risk factors are. And you can see high blood pressure or preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, preterm birth, um, and these are things that you can do because your primary care physician or your cardiologist needs to know that you did have gestational diabetes or you did have preeclampsia or high blood pressure during pregnancy because it definitely is uh, impacting. Pregnancy uh, complications um, is like a stress test and it identifies women who would benefit from primary prevention e efforts to reduce ACVD even at a young age. And don't forget, Younger women with heart disease do worse, much worse than the cohorts who are postmenopausal. So we call this adverse pregnancy outcomes or APOs. Um, again, just showing you preterm uh, uh, delivery, gestational diabetes, um, hypertension, preeclampsia, um, and a couple of others. More than 80% of women will bear at least one child in their lifetime. 30% of those 80% of women will have an APO. So you should know your risk. 
And there, again, is another connection here between breast health and heart. Um, women who have breast cancer, they get radiation, they get chemotherapy, they have um, BRCA genes, they have other things that impose uh, on their uh, overall uh, cancer treatment, and that cancer treatment can uh, impact cardiovascular disease. In 1991, as I said, uh, the Women's Health Initiative uh, wanted to understand how the uh, diseases affect postmenopausal women, and as I told you, um, we found out that estrogen and progesterone hormone therapy increased breast cancer, the risk of breast cancer, heart disease, stroke, clots, and urinary incontinence in women. Um, so. Even though women had a lower risk of fractures and some mild lowering risk of colorectal disease, um, cancer disease, the benefits did not outweigh the risks. So um, <clears throat> the FDA today urges women who are taking hormone therapy to take the lowest helpful dose for the shortest amount of time. Median causes of death in the U.S., 2017, a little bit more up-to-date data, and you can see heart disease still accounts for 21%, despite the gains that we made um, over the last 10 years. Um, it is still the number one killer, and uh, cancer is number two, um, and again, uh, a very important um, issue. Now, heart disease and breast cancer are common risk factors, of course, you know, Patients who have breast cancer are exposed to radiation. Um, they're exposed to uh, anthracycline chemotherapy, heart failure, and a drug called Herceptin, which is very, very popular in heart, can uh, heart disease treatment. And they are seven times more likely to develop heart disease or heart failure if they're receiving anthracycline therapy and Herceptin. So breast cancer, and there's a whole science of cardio, you know, cardio-oncology is a burgeoning field, and we're looking out for those patients because we understand those risks. Even the uh, checkpoint inhibitors and some of the newer chemotherapies have cardiac toxicity. So we need to take a, how do we assess heart disease? We need to take a multifactorial, multifactorial approach. It's not one size fits all. This is a puzzle. We have to put the puzzle pieces together. It's not as clear cut as we once thought it was. There's a lot more work. What can you do for yourself to take control of your health? Well, you need to control your own destiny, which means you have to be somewhat of a leader and someone of, who's gonna uh, provoke the conversation. If you have symptoms, of course, get help. If you have chest pain, unusual epigastric pain, extreme fatigue, palpitations, these things need to be addressed. Please see a physician. You need to see someone for this. Have regular health checks. Do not let the pandemic control your health. There's an excessive amounts of death from the pandemic because people are not getting regular checkups. Don't become collateral damage. Be proactive, ask your physician about your individual risks. Um, things change in medicine at a rapid pace. The data that comes at doctors is continually changing. So you need to also ask the questions and get regular uh, opinions from your physician because what's happening in one year may change radically in the next visit. This is just to show you how you can become collateral damage. One in three excess deaths in the U.S. is not directly caused by COVID-19. Now, we know that COVID-19, there's almost a half a million people going to die this year of this, this COVID epidemic. We're a little bit coming up to the year mark, unfortunately. And here on the right-hand side shows how many excess heart attacks and cerebrovascular de deaths occur, okay? These are collateral damage deaths that could have been prevented. Calcium score, what is this and how can it help you? Well, calcium scoring is a low dose CT scan aimed at detecting deposits. Your physician decides whether you're a candidate for this. It allows your cardiologist to refine his or, his or her ability to assess your risk of having heart disease. Your cardiologist may change your medical therapy based on the 10 year risk assessment and the calculated score. This is a relatively new tool, but very, very useful, and your cardiologist can use this in addition to your risk profile to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So yes, we, we have the Red Dress program. I hope you all know that. But I think you would recognize the Susan Komen uh, blue pink ribbon more than the Red Dress program. 
even though, and I'm not, again, not beating up on breast cancer, even though heart disease is a much larger killer of women in the United States than breast cancer right now. So maybe we should have our football players uh, on Super Bowl Sunday next week doing something red. They all usually wear the pink shoes and the pink, you know, and they're, they're in touch with their feminine side, great. But how about the red dress? I think we don't get enough airtime or enough playtime. So we need to promote that. And you guys can join the American Heart Association and ask them, sponsor something on the NFL, sponsor something on women's tennis, do something to help promote women's health, which they are doing, but let's keep it going. Again, this is the lifetime remaining risk. I think, you know, went over that. So look, heart disease in women versus men, let's fill in the pieces of the puzzle. Not one size fits all. This is an approach we have to take. Your physician has to be aware of this. They have to be understanding women's health a little bit more than they do. Let's break the glass ceiling in cardiovascular health. We can do this together. Women are breaking glass ceilings every single day. Let's take this one with us. And let's all unite and we're gonna go red. This is uh, for our wives, our sisters, our mothers, our brothers, families and friends. We all want them to survive and not have a devastating disease. I wanna thank you all for your attention today and I hope uh, you're enlightened and more knowledgeable after our talk today and uh, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you.